to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 2 and also Philippians 2 today. Let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and you can follow along. Scripture says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that it is living, that it is powerful. God, we thank you that it pierces to the inner depths of our being. It teaches us about you. Lord, as we look at this topic of the mind of Christ, Lord, help us to have the mind of Christ. Help us to live out the mind of Christ. Help us, Lord, to think about our decisions, our activities, our work, our school, our play, Lord, as Jesus would think about them, and to represent him in all we do. Lord, we pray now that you would just teach us by your Holy Spirit, which we've just read about, the things you would have us to know. And we pray it. When you, um, when you work for someone, or you're on a team, or you're at a school, or whatever, whoever the leader is, it's helpful to know how they think. It's helpful to know what's important to them and what's going through their mind so that you know, we can be the best employee or student or you know, participant of a team um, that we can be. I had the opportunity right out of college before I followed the Lord's call to ministry to work for Hallmark Park. And um, Tim, I've got a picture up there, I think. The founder of Hallmark Park, J.C. Hall. In 1910, he went to Kansas City, got off the train, he had two uh, shoe boxes of postcards, not greeting cards, but postcards. 
and he began selling those on the streets, uh, 18 years old. And um, he, had, he had no money. He didn't even have enough money for his cab fare from the train to the, his YMCA, where he was staying at the YMCA. Um, but he began peddling these cards, and you know the story, over several decades, he built Hallmark cards into a multi-billion dollar corporation. And uh, his employees fondly called him Mr. JC. He died about seven years before I started there, but I still hear, heard stories of the people that had worked with him for decades. And he was a, a great man, he was a hard worker, and um, some of the quotes that he had, I think there's a quote up there, Tim. Um, if a man goes into business with only the idea of making a lot of money, chances are he won't. But if he puts service and quality first, the money will take care of itself. He also said, another quote, producing a first class product that is a real need is a much stronger motivation for success than getting rich. Over the years, people, when they worked there, they would start working a new project, a new process, a new card, and they would ask themselves, how would Mr. JC want to do this? How would he approach this? What, what would his values be as he looked at this new product? And as believers in Christ and workers for the Lord and workers in the kingdom, you can see where I'm going with this. I mean, we need to know what is Jesus' mind about the things that we are involved in, about how we live, about how he wants us to represent him. That when we go to work, when we go to school, when we play, when we're in our community, to have in our mind, how would Jesus view these situations? How would Jesus view this decision that I have to make? How would he want me to act? And this morning, our, our last verse in the passage that we looked at, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16, it says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? So it's a rhetorical question. It's like, well, who can know the mind of God? Who knows what God thinks like? You know, God's God. We're us. You know, how... But Paul says, but we do know the mind of the Lord because we have the mind of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. We have what he's thinking. We have his word. And this morning I want to look at some things that Jesus' mind is focused on. And then, by natural application, the things that we should be focused on as believers. And the first thing that we see, number one, is that Jesus' mind, first slide there, Tim, was focused on people. Was focused on people. A couple of verses, the scene where Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and he was instructing them about what was important, and specifically thinking of Jerusalem and Israel here, says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, opposite of what they should do, stones those who are sent to her, opposite of what they should do. Look what he says with compassion. He says, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Just that heart for people. How often, O oh Jerusalem, I wanted to protect you, to shelter you, to help you, and you, you wouldn't do it. But Jesus has a heart for people. Matthew 15, 32, the feeding of the multitudes. 
Jesus saw them all, and they'd been listening to him, and they were famished, and they had been there. And he says, now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. To have the mind of Jesus is to have a deep, deep love for people. I thought about our Wild for God program this summer as I was putting this together. And I thought, you know, it would have been a lot easier to use Monday nights doing something else. You know, to mow the yard at home, to help Delana with laundry, which I do all the time. Just like I'm, I'm all, just ask her. And just do chores at home and that type of thing. It would have been easier for everybody involved to do something else. It would have been easier to give your money for something else instead of the mere, you know, 12 to 20 kids that we we have. The kids that we see running around on the street during the summer, riding their bikes and their skateboards and. It would have been easier just to let them hang and do their thing and us to do something different. But I think Jesus would have been here. Working with them, teaching them, loving them, feeding them. When we planned Wild for God, <coughs> we advertised it everywhere. We put it in the Pleasant Hill Living magazine. We put cards in couple schools here that, you know, about 800 kids. Um, we, 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 we just, we had signs up. Our big concern was is that we're going to be overwhelmed with kids. I'm just like, we're going to have to turn kids away. But for whatever reason, the Lord knows, we ended up with just a, a small number of kids. But I think of the times that Jesus stepped aside from the crowd, stepped out of his path that he was going to talk to one person, to talk to just a few people. I think I mentioned this last week, the week before, that Jesus wasn't just about the multitude. He was about individuals. He was about reaching the few as well as the many. And you can never reach the many without reaching the few. And the first few weeks, you know, I, I didn't verbalize a lot, but I was kind of frustrated. I'm like, man, where's, where did all these invites go? Where are all these parents at that, that should want to bring their kids to this? And I think, you know what? God knows exactly who he wanted here. And he allowed us to minister them. They had heard the word of God. They heard the gospel. They heard Jesus loves them. They met a church and adults that loved them. And it's just what Jesus would do. Jesus' mind is focused on people. <laughs> There's a lot of things that we in this world can do. We can invest in property. We can invest in 401Ks and IRAs and all these things, Roth IRAs. Man, there's all kinds of different things. We can put money and time and build our career and get good at certain sports. There's all kinds of things we can invest in, but there's only one thing we can invest in that's going to heaven. It's going to last forever. That is people. People are the only thing that are going to escape from this world. And God's called us to, to love them. And Jesus loves them. I love the picture of the woman taken in adultery. That Jesus, they wanted to kill her, and Jesus had compassion on her. Of the disciples keeping the children away from him. And he says, suffer the little children, let them come unto me. Jesus is about, about people. He's also, his mind is also focused on service. Number two, focused on service. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, 
says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it, to be ro- consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross serving other people. His priority, number one, is people, and number two, is using his his life while he was on earth, using his abilities to serve humanity. Remember the time that the disciples were walking on the road and uh, they began arguing, you know, who was going to be first. And they came to Jesus and said, when we come into the kingdom, Jesus, put one of us on your left hand and put one of us on your right hand, you know, the seats of honor at the table. And uh, the disciples all began arguing about it. And um, I think the ones that were upset about it were upset because they hadn't thought about it first. Shoot, I wish I would have asked Jesus if I could sit on his right hand and left. And they beat us to it. Remember what Jesus told them. He said, he who is first will be last. He who is last will be first. He said, if you want to be great in the kingdom, learn to be a servant. And then he demonstrated to them how to be a servant because he picked up a towel and washed their feet. And they saw him day in and day out serve the people and love the people and turn water to wine and feed multitudes. And something about serving that we have a hard time with as people, I have got bug bites like over my whole body. I just want to tell you that. So if I'm up here scratching like a monkey, it's like I've just got bites and I've got sunburn and got bites like in my hair. It's crazy. <clears throat> it has nothing to do with serving, but I just want you to know why I'm scratching like crazy. Um, but something about serving that we have a hard time with as people is that when we serve someone, it takes the attention off ourselves. It takes the focus off ourselves. We have to put our own priorities aside, and we have to consider the person we're serving and their needs and their desires, and their wants, and and what we can do with the gifts and abilities we've been given to meet those things. And the natural man and natural woman is all about us. It's about I, 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 me, 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 I want, I build, I get, I acquire, I satisfy my needs. I And if we become like Jesus, we've got to brush all that aside and say it's not about us, Like Jesus did here, verse 7, he made himself of no reputation, the king of heaven, I hear a tornado coming, it's not a tornado, I hear something, Um, the king of heaven, who rightfully could have come down and said, I'm here, I'm Jesus, serve me. He could have rightfully said that. He's he's a king of creation. He didn't. Probably the greatest act of humility ever shown. It's shown through Jesus being born in a manger. Being born, coming from heaven, you know, the throne room of heaven that we've looked at in Revelation. with people worshiping him, angels worshiping him, and coming down and being in a barn and having animals smell him. Is that amazing? And then allowing himself here to be killed, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death 
of the cross. Only Jesus could die on the cross. He's not calling us to die on the cross. But we cannot serve him until we put to death our own desires, our own needs, our own selfishness. So long I've been talking about this off and on for a couple months. And I told her the other night, I think the, I think the defining element of sin is another S word, and it's selfishness. And we cannot serve until we become selfish. And we look at the example of Christ. So Jesus' mind is focused on people. He's focused on serving. And he's also focused on Number three, God's will and not his own will, the Father's will. Now, we understand the Trinity. We understand he understands all of these things. He's God. He's deity. But when he was here, Luke twenty-two forty-two, 42, when he was preparing for the cross, when he knew what was coming, the most agonizing way a person could be executed in that time the crucifixion of a cross he says father if it is your will take this cup away from me take this cup of suffering take this this agonizing event ordeal that I'm going to go through but he said nevertheless not my will but yours Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He was focused on the Father's will, on God's will. Next week, we have a guest speaker coming, Josh Collier, from our sponsoring church. He's been the children's pastor there for 10 years. I don't want to steal his thunder, but I want to tell you why I invited him. They had a major wedding anniversary, and they wanted to go on vacation somewhere. And so they're, you know, talking about where are we going to go on vacation, and they had some friends in Morocco. And he decided, well, let's, let's go to Morocco. I mean, who goes to Morocco on vacation? Northern Africa, 99.9% Muslim. But they had some friends that lived there. So they went there and uh, hung out with them for a week to 10 days and rode camels and all this stuff and began getting a heart for those people began asking God, what would you have us to do? And they came back, and about six months later, after they prayed about and prayed about it, they felt God calling them to Morocco. So he's resigned his position as children's pastor. They're going to pack up their five kids, five kids, five kids, young kids, not very old, and take them to northern Africa to a heavily Muslim country and do whatever God's will is, what God wants them to do, to share the gospel there, to reach people for Jesus. But I don't know what God has called you to do. I mean, I know he's called me to do. I don't know everything he's called me to do. We pray about that. But it's not always easy to do God's will. It's always possible. He always gives us the ability but it doesn't mean it's easy. Jesus agonized over this. He agonized over it. In 18 years of ministry, there have been some easy, easy things God has called us to do, and there has been some extraordinarily difficult things he has called us to do. There's been some ways where the path was just paved as smooth as glass to do it, and there has been times where there's obstacle after obstacle after obstacle to do it. And he teaches you something different in every one of those situations. That it's to be focused on God's will and not our will. And Jesus was focused on the will of the Father and not himself escaping the suffering that he had been called on to experience for us. Jesus' mind is focused on people 
on serving, on God's will, and number four, he's focused on giving people new and eternal life. New and eternal life. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I don't think we can overemphasize that enough. That he is about taking people who are dead spiritually, who have no concept of God, who have no concept of eternity, no concept of a soul, and seeing them introduced to the gospel, seeing them introduced to God, seeing them hear the word, seeing them hear the gospel, that Jesus in a miraculous way, in a mysterious way, died for their sins so they could be reconciled with a holy God and to get new and real and abundant, eternal life. The lives that most people in this world are living are lives of death. They are. It's all, it's all about selfishness. It's all about, you know, it's all about getting the next thing. It's all about getting the next raise. It's all about getting the next degree. It's all about, it's all about us. And it's all about, it's not about God. It's not life. Most people that we see walking around at Walmart, at the city market, at, you know, at our schools, our jobs, are living a a life of just existence, right? Living for the weekend, living for the next thing. That sounds so depressing. I'm sorry to sound so depressing on that, but it's, if you've been there, you understand it. That there is no life without Jesus. There's no life without knowing the creator of the universe. And Jesus came to seek out those who are far, far, far from him and bring them back to the Father. So what about us? How can we have the mind of Christ? There was a book written in, late, I think it was the early part of the last century, century by Oswald Sanders called In His Steps. It's a great book. If you ever had, how many have read In His Steps? Okay. It's where the little bracelet, What Would Jesus Do, came from. And it was about a pastor in Topeka, Kansas, of all places. I lived in Missouri a long time, so Kansas, nothing good can come out of Kansas, especially Lawrence. Dan was telling me that. Um, and it was about a pastor who challenged his congregation that before every decision they make as they're at home and work and play, that they would ask one question. They would ask, what would Jesus do? And to do that, you have to have the mind of Christ. You have to be thinking about what would Jesus do in this situation? And so let's look at a few things on that, how to have the mind of Christ. And the first thing from our passage is we have to have the spirit of Christ. The verse that we already read, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned have the spirit of Christ. And to have the spirit of Christ, we need to be born again. We need to be saved. We need to know him as our Savior. We need to have moved from that place of being dead spiritually to being alive spiritually and having the Holy Spirit. The things of this world or the things of God are foolishness to people of this world. But if we have the Holy Spirit, we can we can know. And it's not just having the Holy Spirit, it's being filled with the Spirit. And being filled is not some miraculous 
extra event, I don't believe. I think it is an intentional submission to the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life and the leading and being open to his will. And always ask him, Lord, use me. Lord, what would you do with me? Lord, how would you work in this situation? I love the song that Dan picked where it talks about that at the cross, you beckon me. I love that. That's a great, we don't use that word enough anymore. That he beckons us. And you have to be submissive to his beckoning. Because he can beckon and we can say no. We can say, well, Lord, I'm not, I'm not ready for that. Or, Lord, I need to do this first. Or, Lord, you know, that's just too big of a calling. Kind of like Moses. You know, I can't speak well, Lord. I, you know, I need help. I, they're going to kill me. I'm At the cross, you beckon me. And then it's sweetly broken. He, we have to allow him to break our own desires and our own will. And that just sounds like, oh, well, shoot, man. You know, there's nothing in it for me. There's, no, there's going to be no joy because I'm not doing what I want to do. And, and then it's like totally opposite. If we're surrendered to him, he's not going to lead us into something that's not going to be his will and not be fulfilling and not be marvelous. I'm sure... Josh Collier and Janine, right? Janine. Janice? Close enough. Janice. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going on vacation. I'm kind of looking forward to this. Janice. I'm sure Morocco wasn't like top of their list. Okay, God's will for our life. Morocco. I'm, I'm sure that wasn't like at the top of their list. But the Lord know what he's going to provide satisfaction and fulfillment as they break their own will and surrender to his will sweetly broken and surrendered to have the spirit of christ i know lots of christians who they've been indwelt with the spirit but man they are not filled with the spirit because they're not being obedient to the spirit they're not being sensitive to the Spirit. They're crowding out the Spirit with their own desires and goals. So to have, to have the mind of Christ, to have the Spirit of Christ, let her be to get that, to spend time in His Word. Spend time in His Word. George Barna says that only like 10% of Christians read their Bible you know, every day. And, and I understand the busyness of life. It's just wake up in the morning and my mind is on my to-do list. Is yours like that? I mean, I just start processing immediately when I wake up. Well, maybe not immediately. First thing I do is you know, get up and take that short walk to that little room I need to. But uh, just tell you I'm a real person, okay? I'm a real person, just like you are. And then it's like, okay, take on the day. But God gave us his word to spend time in it, to tells us to meditate on it in the night season. He tells us to dwell upon it. He says we're blessed if we meditate upon it. We spend time in his word. The word of God may be under more attack today than at any time in its history. Even during the dark ages, I think. Even during the Reformation. It may be under attack even more because the modern media can go around the whole world and they're just constantly things that are digging at their credibility and reliability of the Word of God. We see it all the time. And e even academics that should know better. Bart Ehrman uh, has written a book called Misquoting Jesus. He's a biblical scholar, a secular biblical so scholar, at the University of North Carolina. In his book, he said there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of errors in the scriptures. And he's basing it off a scribe like translating one letter incorrectly and then it was 
copied all these other manuscripts, and he called, no, it's not thousands and thousands and thousands. It was one copy of mistake. It doesn't affect any doctrine whatsoever. And he's multiplied it, multiplied it, multiplied it, and now he's been on, you know, PBS and all kinds of Discovery Channel and whatever, and he is the golden boy for those who want to discredit the Bible. I really don't even want to spell his name or tell it to you again because I don't want you to read his stuff. But that's where we're filled with the Spirit. We rely on the Spirit to help us, but Bart Ehrman. And the problem is, not only is he academically incorrect, he's academically lying. I can't even believe that he gets by with it. It's unbelievable. He distorts the evidence like crazy. And I've seen, I mean, I've studied the languages. I've looked at what he has said, and it's just flat out wrong. And he's lying to everybody. Everybody just eats it up. Media eats it up, eats it up, eats it up. It's just, it's so frustrating. But we know who's in control. We know God's in control. Amen. He's in control. He's the one that's going to protect his word. He's the one that's going to preserve his word. But to spend time in the word helps us to have the mind of Christ. Letter C, to have the mind of Christ through prayer. Talking with God through prayer. Being sensitive to him as we approach new situations. Asking for his help. You see, Jesus was a man of prayer. He wanted to commune with the Father, commune with the Holy Spirit. He would go out early in the day and pray, go up to the mountain to take time to pray. So how to have the mind of Christ, to have the Spirit of Christ, to spend time in His Word, to spend time in prayer. And D, I don't know how to cultivate this in you, but to learn to love people. Learn to love people. And especially to learn to love those who are unlike you. We tend to gravitate toward people that are like us. You know, that look like us, smell like us, talk like us, go in our circles and and, and we tend to have small circles. But if we're going to be like Jesus, we need to learn to love those who are unlovable, who are looked down upon, who are without hope, to especially learn to love them because that's who Jesus loved. In James, James says, pure and undefiled relig- religion is this, is to visit the fatherless those that are orphaned, those that are widowed, those that are in prison. I love hearing Jose talk about being in the prison ministry. Bill Eisenhower is in the prison ministry. Those that are without hope and to share the gospel with them and to hear stories about them coming I want you to just make a little line in your mind, a little blank in your mind, or fill in the blank in your mind. And I want you to think about, as you travel during the week and go about your routine, I want you to think about the place that you see people that are the most unlovable. And I want you to fill that blank. Is it, is it a street corner with someone with a sign, you know, need food or something? Is it someone in your neighborhood that just, oh, have a hard time getting along with? Is it a smelly neighbor kid that's just always, you know, throwing his toys in your yard or something like that? And then I want you to think about how would Christ love
love that person? How would he do that? What, does, what would that look like if Jesus encountered that person and then pray and ask God to help you respond to that person in the same way? Because that's what he would want us to do. I don't think any of the kids are here that were on the camp out. So I'm just going to share this. <coughs> Saturday morning, we stayed up late, and it rained on us, and the campground at Lake Oswabi was, was quiet, except for one section. Our section, okay? And some of our kids on the camp out, man, they, they only have one volume. It is loud. It is to get attention. It is so people will hear them and they can get what they need. And it's just, whoo. I mean, it was like I walked up through the campground. I thought, oh, it's so quiet and serene. And walked down to our section. Loud. It was just loud. Even before I got out of my tent, I could hear certain voices. And I thought, Jesus loves that one. That's why we're doing this. Because Jesus loves them and he wants us to love them. And he wants you to love those people in your life. To move toward them. To not just walk by them and say, oh yeah, Jesus loves that person. I love them too. This is awesome. No. To move toward them. To intentionally interact with them. To find out about them. To care for them pray for them, to see a need, and flip them, flip them something to help them with, to do something tangible, to show them the love of Jesus, to have the mind of Christ. I pray that our church would have the mind of Christ, would have the love of Christ, would move toward people in our community, and I pray that each one of you and myself would seek to have his mind and allow him to work through us to change our city for the Lord. Let's stand together and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for saving us and giving us your spirit. Lord, help us as a church and individuals and in our community to live in such a way that we reflect the priorities of Christ, that we reflect what's on his mind. Lord, to love people, to serve people, to think about God's will in every aspect of our life and to think about those who are lost and far from you and how could you use us to introduce them to your son. Lord, people, many people just living in desperation. And Lord, the gospel can change their forever. Help us to have a passion for that. Help us, Lord, to see that our life can best be spent spreading the good news.